Hey, I'm sorry to call you out on that. It is a confusing, <laughs> it is a confusing timeline. I should have done a postdoc, but um, just in case there's anybody who's interested in going into liberal arts colleges, um, as a theorist, I was a little bit of a weird animal at the time for liberal arts colleges. They didn't like to hire theorists, but they were somewhat interested in me, and so I convinced them that theorists didn't need to do postdocs. <laughs> they probably wouldn't fall for that again, though, but that's what, that's what it worked for me. Um, good, so thank you so much for inviting me. I'm excited to be here. It's um, fun to have such a big, rowdy crowd. Um, and I hope that you'll ask questions uh, during the talk. And uh, I want to talk to you about um, Bose-Einstein condensates in a somewhat newish, and hopefully I can convince you, interesting geometry. Um, and I'll primarily be talking about collective modes, but um, some other things as well. And just in case you're curious, my primary position is at Smith College, but I'm shared with UMass Amherst. All right, uh, let's do acknowledgments first. So the collaborators on this work on the collective modes are mostly uh, Smitha Wishweshwara at Illinois and Kwe Sun, who's at, currently at UT Dallas. Um, the stuff in the second half of the talk, um, I'll be talking about someone that many of you probably know. Nathan Lundblad used to be here, I guess, as a postdoc, and he has a NASA grant to uh, do some of the things that we'll be talking about at the second half of the talk. Um, the work you're going to see, a lot of it was done by undergraduates, um, either at Smith or at Wellesley. And uh, the funding is from NSF and from NASA. And I want to thank the KITP, where I spent my sabbatical, well, the first half of my sabbatical last semester. And some of the very early work on the collective modes was actually done at the Aspen Center for Physics. So I should give them a shout out as well. Is my um, volume OK for the people in the back? OK, thanks. All right, I will. I will probably do a short shrift on trying to convince you that BECs are interesting. So <laughs> that might just be um, kind of give you a little bit of a history of what kinds of BEC things I want you to be thinking about going into the talk. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about collective modes. We'll talk about the specific geometry that I'm interested in. And then um, I'll talk a little bit about what we've done so far. All right, so this is going to be probably not pitched exactly right, so possibly embarrassing, but let's all start someplace. Um, Bose-Einstein condensation of uh, dilute ultra-cold atoms, imagining a confining trap. I didn't do a very good job of making it parabolic. Um, you've got some atoms, they're running around. Let's imagine rubidium because it's our favorite. Um, let's imagine we only have a million of them. Now you could have many, many more. Um, if they're at a fairly high temperature, they're just regular old atoms. Bose-Einstein condensation, one way of thinking about it is that a significant number of the atoms are all in the same quantum mechanical state. And that's really um, the perspective that I'm coming from, from BEC. I'm going to be treating the many-body wave function psi of position and time as being the thing that we need to study about Bose-Einstein condensates. There are lots of other things, of course, to study about Bose-Einstein condensates, but that's just sort of the perspective that I want you to be thinking about. And this is a macroscopic, sometimes really rather huge number of atoms acting quantum mechanically as though they were one atom. And so I come at that, I would say primarily from a perspective of macroscopic manifestation of wave function physics. So these are now totally classic experiments where you can manipulate uh, essentially the trap or the shape of what your BEC is doing. You can now do many much cooler things. I was just talking to Gretchen about what you can do when you have these amazing mirror arrays. You can program essentially any picture you want and the BEC will just form that shape. So we'll be, we will definitely be uh, in that line of reasoning as we're talking about some really weird shape traps that will confine the BEC to some kind of odd geometries. Um, once you have a really large number of particles that are all described by one wave function, you start being able to see really cool manifestations of quantum physics that's supposed to happen on the individual level, but happening on a much larger level. And so this is, I would say, one of the classic interference experiments with BECs, and we'll be doing a little bit of interference towards the end of the talk. Um, this is in a direction that I'm not yet, but many of you will probably see in the geometry that I'm going to tell you about some interesting things that could happen with vortices. So I want to remind you that um, BECs also act a little bit like superfluids in that they have these quantized places where circulation can happen. Okay, so that was my whole introduction. <laughs> um, because I think uh, you all think BECs are cool too. 
So <laughs> let's move into, um, I want to try to convince you that collective modes of VECs are interesting or at least give you a frame of reference um, for collective modes in general. So here I'm, I'm picturing a harmonic trap. I'm drawing just what an individual atom would do in that harmonic trap. Here's your potential for the trap. It's got some trap frequency omega naught. If you just displaced an individual atom in the trap, it would oscillate back and forth with this frequency omega naught. Somewhat surprisingly, I know there's a theorem that says it has to be so, but it's one of those math things that I wouldn't have guessed. If you have a BEC in this trap, of course it forms some sphere, and it's millions of atoms all in one sphere. If you displace that sphere by a little distance d, the whole sphere moves back and forth, and it oscillates with exactly the same frequency that the individual particle would. Even though there's interactions between the atoms, even though it's this cool state of matter, it acts just like a single, basically, thermal atom would. There's another mode, though, that does get at some of the more interesting physics of the BEC. If you think about the same trap, so you've got a solid sphere of atoms, essentially. Another collective mode is where the radius of that sphere just changes in time. It goes out a little bit beyond equilibrium, it comes back in. So the cloud is getting less dense and more dense, and it oscillates back and forth. This is often called the breathing mode because it's very similar to what we picture happening in our lungs. So this is a case where the radius of the cloud, in some sense, R of T, is oscillating. And here, the frequency of that oscillation is related to the frequency of the underlying trap, but it's not equal to it. And in fact, you can have different frequencies of this breathing mode depending on whether the interactions between the atoms are weak or strong. And I think that's interesting because that means that the frequency will actually tell you something about those microscopic interactions that are happening in the BEC. So those are classic collective mode experiments for the simplest BEC, the first BEC, the BEC just in a harmonic trap that's a solid sphere. I want to talk to you about a somewhat newish geometry. It's newish in the sense that the theory for the kind of trap and some of the early experiments on the trap were done in the last 10 years, but um, we're still trying to achieve the full <coughs> geometry that I'm going to tell you about. But it's uh, one way of saying it is it's a spherical shell. So what does that mean? Again, this is just a 2D cut. It's not actually a ring. It's a full sphere, but it's hollow in the center. One way that you could make that would be to imagine that you could somehow create a harmonic trap, but whose radius was offset. So the minimum of the trap was actually out at some finite radius. So the condensate wants to collect here, but all the way around in the full sphere, and then it's just hollow at the center. Make sense? We've got the geometry. I'm going to keep drawing it in a 2D cut, but because I know there's a lot of ring physics going on here, I want to make sure you're picturing it as the full sphere. I could also obviously just cut it along one dimension because it's spherically symmetric. And if I just cut the sphere along the x dimension, then what you might see if I was plotting, say, the density of atoms is just two bumps. And I just want to set some parameters here. They're not very interestingly named. R0 might be, say, the mean radius of the condensate. You would expect that to essentially be right at the minimum of your trap. There's also going to be a width of your condensate. Any ideas what's going to set the width of the condensate? Number of atoms, absolutely. Put more atoms in there, what's going to happen to the width? It's going to go up. Good. The trap frequency is a way that an experimentalist could conceivably tune how thick or thin this is going to be if you kept the number of particles the same. Okay, so those are two handles that you could think about having experimental control over. You can change where the mean radius is, this R0, and then by changing this trap frequency, you could conceivably change the thickness if you kept the number of particles and their interaction the same. Um, just for the purposes of later on, in case anybody asks me, there's also a maximum condensate density in this trap, and that might be something else that you could conceivably measure um, if you could do like in situ or something. Okay, let's think about what would the collective modes of this be. Okay, so I have a quantum fluid. It's confined to essentially the surface of a sphere. It has some thickness and it has some mean radius. Let's go to a very, 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 very thin shell. The reason for that being that mathematically it'll then turn into essentially a 1D problem and those are easier. So 
not easy necessarily, but this one is pretty easy. Um, if you go to a very, very thin shell, and then we'll make it more realistic in a minute, you could certainly picture one collective mode where that mean radius changed, but the thickness stayed more or less the same. Okay, that turns out to be in um, some sort of nomenclature of quantum numbers. That's an L equals zero, meaning that it's spherically symmetric, and an N equals one mode, because it turns out that the density deviations have one node. But it doesn't really matter. You could just picture it as a breathing mode for the shell. It looks like this, the sphere's breathing mode in the sense that the outer radius is changing. The problem, though, is that there's an, obviously another breathing mode of the shell, where the outer radius would also change, but where now the mean radius is staying more or less the same, and it's just the thickness of the shell that's oscillating. Okay, and it turns out in that nomenclature, you're still going to be L equals zero, because this is spherically symmetric, but this is what you would call the N equals two mode. Did I skip over the previous results? Sorry. Back here, you can do a number of different theories for the very, very thin shell, so again, in this 1D limit, and convince yourself that the frequency of this breathing mode should be the same as the frequency of small oscillations in the offset trap. And that doesn't depend on interactions, which is kind of interesting. Um, what does depend on interactions is the frequency of this mode, where the thickness changes, but the radius stays more or less the same. And here you see different frequencies than you saw for the filled sphere. I don't expect you to remember, but this was a square root of five. Um, and, but you still see something different in the weak and the strong limit. Okay, so this is the breathing type mode that has some relationship with interactions, and the other breathing type mode is the one that we kind of expect to be more fixed. Now, presumably we shouldn't be surprised that it's different, but on the other hand, it is perhaps surprising that in the one case, these strong interactions increase, their, and here it decreases. Can you give us a feeling for why that's so? Such a good question. Um, not right this second, but when I show you the full evolution, we might be able to figure it out. Sorry, I'm going to totally dodge that, but I hope to come back to it. Good, keep that in the back of your heads. Okay, so I think this is kind of a cool idea to make a hollow sphere and then ask yourself, how is it different? The question is, can you actually make a hollow sphere? Can you trap BECs in this shape? And there is, um, there is a way to do it. It's what's called a bubble trap. I should, sorry, I should have had a reference on here. I think um, theoretical paper, paper was by Zobay and Garraway. This might be taken from, no, this is taken from Nathan's grant. Um, they actually have made these in the Perrin group in Paris. Um, let me walk you through it. This is an ordinary harmonic trap that you would create. And then, how many of you have heard of evaporative cooling? Okay, good. Many of you who make BECs and you want to keep them in this right side up parabolic trap, but you want to cool them so you do what's called evaporative cooling. And what you're really doing is you're making a leak so that the atoms that are high enough in energy will go away and the atoms that are left over will be lower in temperature. Apologies to anyone who does this all the time who's like, come on. But that's the way I picture it. What you're doing in some sense is you're adding an additional potential such that the sum is, look at this blue line here, this is the trap you want to use if you're evaporative cooling. You want your atoms to stay here that are low in energy, and this leak here will allow the high energy ones to go away. But because of the way you're doing this, you're actually also creating this upside down version of it that will be seen by the other hyperfine state. And that is actually a bubble trap. That is going to make a shell because the minimum is out here, and they don't want to sit in the center because there's this big bump but they're confined at large R's. So this top potential has all the features of what we wanted to create a spherical shell. So let me give you an overview of it. This is the potential that's in that Zobay and Garraway paper. It, you might not like the way it looks, so let me try to convince you that it's got some really nice features. Um, this parameter delta is controlling where the minimum of the potential is. If delta is equal to zero, and let's set omega to zero at the same time, then you're just getting exactly a harmonic trap. So that's nice, you can recover a harmonic trap. As you change delta and make it larger, the square root of delta, so if I go to delta of 30, we see that the minimum has moved out 
2, it turns out the square root is 30. Okay, as you continue to ramp up delta, what you're getting is a minimum of the trap that moves out to farther and farther radii. One of the things I want to point out, just in case you really don't like this and you say, why don't you just make a wine bottle potential, that would be much simpler. The problem with the wine bottle potential is that at large R, it's quartic. And as far as I know, there's not an easy way to do that with optical or magnetic fields. So this at large R is quadratic again. So you still have harmonic confinement at the edges, but then you essentially have this bump in the middle. And what you can tune with this parameter delta, which is sort of a knob in the experiment, is you can change where that minimum radius is going to, sorry, where the, ra where the minimum of the potential is going to be, so where the mean radius of the shell is going to be. So what does this thing big omega here do? Big omega controls the frequency of small oscillations at that minimum radius. So it's actually delta over omega. If you now look at this potential, you can convince yourself that in a Taylor expansion, it is that offset shell potential. And the thing that's playing the role of the frequency of small oscillations is the square root of delta over omega. So you have the ability to tune both if you like that thickness and the mean radius, um, all with these two parameters, delta and omega. Okay. I have to say something, but if you don't like it, you can ignore it. That's not actually what got me interested in the shell. I was originally interested in the shell because I was thinking a lot about bosons in 3D optical lattices and the so-called um, MOT to superfluid transition, whose phase diagram is here. Because these 3D optical lattice experiments are always done in some kind of trap, you're not actually sitting at one point in this phase diagram. You're kind of scanning through a bunch of different points in this phase diagram as you go from the inside of the trap to the outside of the trap. So if you had a perfectly harmonic trap and then you put a 3D optical lattice on it, you are going to get something that has concentric spheres of different phases. And so I was originally thinking about the superfluid that would be coalesced outside of the n equals mod, n equals one mod phase. Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah, it's not, it was never a ring, it's always been a sphere. This is a fully, this is just an R. This is a fully spherical picture. And so it might be possible to use this same trick to make a ring, but what you're doing when you put on the extra RF field to do the evaporative cooling is you're doing that in three dimensions. And so that all the time you're also creating this three dimensional, so this is just R or X, Y, and Z. And so you can make it a 2D version, but I'm thinking of the full 3D version. Good question. Thanks. Good. Yeah, so everything, when I say R, I mean like the spherical coordinate R. But again, just because of the limits of my own ability to draw, I'm going to draw these 2D cross sections. But I want you to picture the 3D case. Okay, so if you don't care about bosons and 3D optical lattices, pay no attention to that slide. Okay, but uh, I mean, a lot of us do. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not this, uh, but yeah. But, um, uh, so is that because your, the, our, our projector is stretching your, uh, your thing out? Yes. It look like a uh, circle? Never mind. Kind I'm sorry, ball. that's not supposed to be a football. From right, from right here, oh, yeah, <laughs> it looks like a circle. <laughs> Sorry, I'm this familiar with the problem. Um, but, but then if I want to do a mock thing, then what I'd be looking for is some kind of a, um, of a lattice that would then be imposed upon this shell. So I'm sorry. I'm thinking about that. No, no, let, let me back up. This is what should happen if I just do a plain vanilla harmonic trap and then I put an optical lattice on it. The density of atoms in the center will be high. Right and the density as we go towards the edges will be low. And that means that in this phase diagram, you're always going this way as you go out in radius. Mm -hmm. And so that means that no matter what you think you're making in the lab, if you think you're making um, the n equals two mot, that might happen at the center of your trap, but outside of that, it's gonna be the n equals one mot. And unless you're at infinite um, 
u or 0j, you're going to have between those two spheres, the spherical n equals 2 mott and a spherical shell of n equals 1 mott, you're going to have a little superfluid right. that's confined to essentially the outside of the mott shell. Or at least some layer of garbage. <laughs> or at least some layer of garbage. Exactly. And that's the question. Is that I think part of the reason why this is hard to see in the experiments is because both because you're trapped by the mott. But so this is not, um, you're not explicitly trying to make a spherical shell. What's happening is that your superfluid is sitting right. trapped between two mots. Right. But, 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 but I, I guess maybe I was making a leap here, I, imagining that one of the reasons why you wanted to make spherical shells was so you could avoid this, uh, this ambiguity and get a region where the density was, uh, was pretty constant and then study that. And then I'm thinking, well, then I need... Um, an optical lattice that is imposed upon this spherical shell. Um, no, what, what I actually wanted was I wanted the bubble trap to tell me something about the superfluid uh, and the 3D okay. optical lattice. Because it's hard to measure it, and we had some surprising results that, at least in some regime, all that those MOT phases were going to do was form the equivalent of a potential that the superfluid sat in. And so I thought if you could just study the superfluid shell on its own, without all this mott, maybe you could understand that separately and then bring it over to understanding the superfluid shell. Because a lot of the predictions for what should happen in this system, particularly to the shells in between the mott phases, have been very difficult to actually access experimentally. I see. So then you would start with, with say, your typical um, harmonically trapped spherical thing, uh, make a mott, have this superfluid layer, and then put this trap on it, this, this shell thing on it, to sort of isolate it, uh, to study it. You could, but I was actually thinking of like two different experiments. Like I'll just, I'll just study the shell yeah. with no optical lattice whatsoever, just, just so that I understand the superfluid in a shell-shaped nice. geometry. And then I'll bring that over to the right. optical right. lattice. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, exactly. Good. Good questions. I didn't think this would actually serve to motivate anyone, but if it does, that's awesome. <laughs> um, okay, let me talk about what, um, what we've actually done. So I hope you're at least a little bit interested in this superfluid shell. Um, I want to talk about how we can find the collective modes. There's actually many, many, many ways, which allowed us some checks, but I'll just show you the one way that I did most of the work on. Um, how do you predict and figure out where these collective modes should be in frequency when you're not all the way in the thin shell limit and you're not in the sphere, but you're kind of anywhere in between? So let me tell you what this is like my obligatory theory slide, what did we do? We're solving the gross Pityevsky equation for that many body wave function <coughs> psi. So this is a time dependent equation. You can solve it with no time dependence to find the ground state and then you can find out what happens to any initial wave function in time as long as you know the trap and you know the interaction strength. So here's the idea. We're going to start with a bubble trap with some particular mean radius and some particular thickness and use this equation to find the numerical ground state. So that means it's at any interaction you want. It doesn't have to be at some particular value of interaction. And then we're going to change the trap to have either a different R naught or a different omega naught. So either a different mean radius or a different thickness. And then we're just going to turn the crank on this differential equation and see what the system does. The low energy excitations of the system should be these collective modes. We should see the thing kind of shaking around in time, and that should give us a way of exciting the spherically symmetric modes and also then measuring what their frequencies are. This is, I would say, inspired by experiment in the sense that this is kind of what you would do in an experiment if you wanted to, you wanted to see the collective modes, is you would kick the system a little bit and then access what the frequencies were coming out. And these are the two parameters that you can most easily tune experimentally, are this mean radius and essentially the thickness or the trap frequency. OK, so let's get another couple of plots to um, set ourselves up. This is the true spherical picture. This is, again, my somewhat poor ability to draw a full shell-shaped BEC. This is what it looks like in a 2D density plot if I just cut it, say, along the x Z plane, and this is what a scan on, say, just the X direction would give you. Um, here I'm showing you actual numerical data for the ground state for some particular value of delta. Um, red is high atom density, and blue is essentially zero atom density. So far, so good? 
Okay, here's the thing that I think is cool about the bubble trap is by just tuning delta, we can go from a harmonic trap or a filled sphere all the way out to a very thin shell. And we know what the collective modes should look like in both of those limits. So let's draw some pictures. If I have an initial, let's just talk about the ground state first, so no time evolution yet. If I just have the delta equals zero harmonic trap, I do my numerical integration to find the ground state at any interaction and you get what you would expect. It's just most dense in the center and then falls off. So this is just your sphere. If I go to a slightly larger value of delta, the potential's minimum moves out. And here's the ground state that I'm gonna get. So what do you notice about this? It's clear that the location of highest density is out at some non-zero r, so that's good. Would you say we have made a shell? I'm seeing this, I'm seeing this. What, what makes this not a shell? if you don't think it's a shell. Well, you have plenty of density in the center. You got plenty of density in the center, exactly. So this is a situation where the highest density is not at r equals zero, but there's still significant density at the center. So this would look a little bit funny, but it's certainly not just an ordinary sphere because it's got this weird location of high density that's not at r equals zero, but the center is still full of stuff. Okay, so what should we do to fix this? Crank delta up, okay, we keep the same number of particles, same interaction, you crank delta up, where are those particles gonna go? They gotta move out. So out here at a delta of say 60, now you might say you have a shell, okay? Now, if you wanna get technical about it, obviously the density is exponential, right? You've got some tails. If you want me to go to a place where there are zero atoms here, you have to ask a somewhat different question. But I would say this is a, a place where the density in the center is pretty close to zero. Okay, so here we've got a shell. Remember, 60 is about where we're getting a shell. Okay, if you go out to 100, I would say you're starting maybe to get close to a thin shell. That makes sense? How would we define a thin shell? If you really wanted to make it concrete, you would take this thickness and divide it by that mean radius, and then you would ask yourself whether that was a small number or not. So here, okay, it's not small, but it's less than one. Now, if I were going to say it was thin, I would say that the first uh, excited state or oscillation ah, yeah. in that annulus or whatever you would call it the, in, in the shell in the shell is bigger than everything else, i.e., temperature, mean field, yeah. and I'm not sure what else you want. <laughs> I think that's more forgiving than what we actually need because I think in order to really be in the limit that those results I gave you were for, we have to not only be in that limit, because I'm doing everything at zero temperature, so I already have to be in that limit. I have to be so far beyond that limit that this thing actually acts like it's one dimensional, in the sense that it only really notices that it has R. It doesn't really notice that it has theta. And so I think, I, I think it has to be probably even thinner than that, but I, should, I, have run, I haven't run those numbers. Okay, but there's always gonna be a characteristic energy. Well, yeah. I don't know. I would, I would always think in, in terms of energy. Yes, and in fact, I and think in this case, the I said, what is it? it's, it's the difference between the frequencies of these two modes, the collective okay. modes, I think. Well, let, let's okay. see, but I think, I think it basically yeah. has to do with, um, it's also maybe a coupling between those modes, I think. So I'm only drawing you uh, um, the delta of 100. We can go all the way out pretty easily to a delta of 200, and there we're really gonna be a thin shell. So I just didn't wanna draw it because this is where most of the story is gonna happen. Yeah. Sorry, wouldn't I want to compare with the azimuthal modes? Ah, you want to do the L not equal to zero modes. Yeah, I think of the spacing between L equals zero and L equals one, for example, or something like, or some of the L modes, that should be small compared to the, the radial motion, if, if I want to really a thin shell. I think you, I think you might be right. The thing that's kind of interesting is that if, as long as my perturbation is radially symmetric, I don't even expect to get any L equals one modes. Okay, but that depends on your perturbation. So. Yeah, yeah, so I'll show you. Notice that all the things that I can do um, with the potential that I told you about are all spherically symmetric, right? If I change delta or if I change that parameter omega that changes the frequency, those are fully spherically symmetric. I don't expect to ever be able to see an L not equals zero mode there. But those would go to zero in frequency. 
they don't go to zero. They go to, so one of them goes to the frequency of small oscillations, and the other one goes to yeah, this the square root. The L not equals zero modes do L go to zero. zero. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. We, theoretically, we have tackled the L not equals zero modes. I'm just, I wasn't going to tell you about them today. But I, I can. I, let's, let's get through this one first, though. Um, so that's changing delta. I want to show you what happens if I stay at a delta of, say, 100, and I change this parameter delta over omega. So if I make that larger, then you get what you would expect in the ground state, which is that even for the same number of particles, we get a thinner condensate. And essentially, that density is just going way higher because you're confining them to a much smaller region, or a much thinner region, I'll say. Okay. So hopefully I've oriented you. Here is a movie of what happens if I change that parameter delta, so that changes the mean radius. All I'm doing is I'm starting with that ground state for one value of delta, and then I'm turning the crank on the gross Podievsky equation at another value of delta. And hopefully, there we go. I think I'm having this loop, so there will be a little um, glitch at some point, but what would you say is happening? Is the thickness of the shell changing? A little. A little. Is the mean radius of the shell changing? Yeah. yeah. So I think when we first did this, we were thinking in this kind of very thin shell limit in our minds, and we were thinking, well, if you just change the mean radius, then all that's going to change is the mean radius. And so we would think that the thickness would stay about the same and the mean radius would change. What's the problem with that stupid theorist idea? There's a fixed number of particles in the system. If it moves out into a larger sphere, it has to become thinner because you're spreading the same number of particles over a much larger surface. And so, in fact, those two modes are coupled. And in fact, if you were to analyze this in frequency space, you're really exciting all of the L equals zero modes just with different amplitudes. So we can analyze pictures like this and pull out sort of the lowest lying in frequency modes. So we can get n equals 1, we can get n equals 2, we can definitely go all the way to n equals 3 pretty easily. But the coupling between them is happening, I, I would say, essentially because the no total number of particles is fixed. So you can't just change the thickness without also changing the radius and vice versa. Yeah. No, it's sudden. It's a quench. Okay. So, in adiabatic, adiabatic change, it would just go, and then it would be there. Yeah, and there you wouldn't see any sloshing at all if it was really adiabatic. Yeah. What are the three modes? Good. <laughs> They're pretty weird. Um, so you have to picture something where the inner and outer radii are oscillating. They're back to being in phase, but with another section in the middle that's moving out of phase. So n equals 1 is like the whole thing moving out and in. n equals 2 is like the inside and outside moving differently. n equals 3 is like there's a new radius in the middle that's moving in one phase, and the other two are moving out of phase with it. I can't see it here because the other two modes are so dominant. But, um, but I don't have a way of isolating just that mode with a quench. But it goes all the way up, right? And then it just becomes harder and harder to picture as you go higher up. We really only went to three because one and two seemed like not far enough. Do the different modes that are, I mean, I, I presume the complexity of this has to do with the fact that we've got these different modes and they're sort of beating against each other. <sighs> it was a pretty complicated motion. It is, it is complicated. If you look at it in a Fourier it's transform, a it's not actually that complicated. You really just see some peaks. But I guess you, you could, yeah, I mean, when you look at it, it looks like it's, it's clearly not just one and two, at least to my eye. Yeah, yeah, I agree there's, with you. There's something else there. And the question that I had is, is three related in a rational way to one and two? That is, the frequency of three related in a rational way? Ah, at, in the very thin shell limit, there's a formula for all of them that depends on n. Yeah. But, so by ra but there's a square root in it. So what do you mean by rational? Well, I mean, not, not a square root. No, they will be related by something with a square root in it. OK, so then, OK, so, so it's awfully hard for me to look at this. In fact, I'm getting woozy. Sorry, we can stop it. <laughs> no, what, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is that, that it's not, it, it looks like it repeats. 
Whereas if there were number of frequencies that were irrationally related to each other, I would expect it not to be repeating. But maybe I'm fooling myself. It's looping. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It's no, looping. I, I understood that part, but I mean, on, on a shorter scale, I saw the loop. There's only three frequencies, Bill. It's kind of looks like it's going to repeat. Well, well, I think all the other frequencies are there. I just don't know how easy they, I don't know how high the amplitude of the other frequencies are. Maybe that's it. Maybe I'm just fooling myself. That's a good question. Obviously, the ratio between these frequencies is the thing that we want experimentalists yeah. to look for. Um, so I don't know if this is, oops. I don't know if you care, but this is, if you wanted to see what it, what it looked like in 1D, so just a cut, it's a little bit easier to see maybe what's happening. You can see that the thickness is changing a little bit. You can see that the mean radius is changing a little bit. These guys are walking around. But you can also see that it's really, as the thickness changes and as the radius changes, the height, meaning the maximum density, has to change a lot. And again, I think that's just because of um, conservation of particles. So um, get past that. OK, so what do we do as we're finding these frequencies? Here was our idea. Um, we can go all the way numerically from a trapped sphere whose frequencies we know, all the way out continuously by changing delta to a thin shell whose frequencies we also know. So we just ran um, numerics like this at lots of different deltas, extracted these L equals zero lowest lying N modes, and then we plot as a function of delta, which is the thing we're tuning, we plot what the frequency of those collective modes is. Okay, and here's what we get from those numerics. Um, sorry, this should probably be upside down. The red mode is the lowest lying mode. This is n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. Again, here is the frequency expressed as a ratio to the trap frequency. And this is, I'm changing delta. So over here at 0, I'm just running on a sphere. Out at about 200, I'm running at what is starting to become a very thin shell. OK, what do you notice about this plot? Um, I need, I'm not sure if I believe this point. So. But the uncertainty in terms of the, what we think the frequency is is about the same size as the, as the actual markers that I'm giving you here. So we, we're pretty careful with these numerics and we pretty much believe this. The things that we thought were good about this when we got these results are that they do match the known filled sphere. This is actually going to be in the strongly interacting limit. So I'm showing you the frequencies that you should get for the collective modes of the filled sphere and the strong interaction limit. And they're also matching, again, because we were running at pretty strong interaction, they're matching also those 1D results for what the thin shell should be. And there's, I mean, these ratios, yeah, are going to be irrational. Um, so that was good. That gave us some confidence that this method is not terribly stupid. But nobody liked this. Why on earth would you go from root 6 to 3 root 3 by going through a minimum in between. Um, this one also, it's not that easy to see, does go down before going back up again. So I didn't like this. Uh, these were results that my thesis student last year got. And I thought, well, we must have done something really stupid because this doesn't make any sense for there to be a dip in the frequency as we go from the thin shell that we understand and the filled sphere that we understand. So we were very concerned about this. Um, and we thought, OK, we must have done something wrong. Let's back up. Um, why is there this dip in frequencies? Let's use a different method and see if we get the same answer. So um, a well-tested way of <coughs> theoretically looking for collective modes is to employ hydrodynamic equations. It's basically a version of the GP equation that treats it like a fluid. That's how you would look for collective modes. That's the smart thing to do. So we reapproach this as a hydrodynamic equation problem. That ends up meaning that you have some eigenvalue equation for your collective modes. You can solve that eigenvalue equation. You have to, at some point, figure out what your equilibrium density is. And because we were in the strong interaction limit throughout, we used what's called the Thomas Fermi approximation for the equilibrium density. That's not important yet, but if you know what the Thomas Fermi approximation is, you'll understand why it becomes important. When we did that, we got this. So same basic plot. You're changing delta here. These are thin shells. The filled sphere is actually somewhere over here because we didn't go all the way to zero. And what has happened to the dip? It's gotten like way worse. <laughs> and so we were like, OK, well, maybe, maybe the dip is real. Um, but what does it mean? 
And we thought, this looks really weird because here the dip is almost like a cusp. There's something very, very discontinuous happening to all three of these modes. And in fact, it goes all the way up. What is special about this radius is what we were asking ourselves. The Thomas Fermi approximation assumes that the BEC has a place where the density goes exactly to zero. So no exponential tails. It just says there's BEC and then wham, right here there's no more BEC. So it's not a very good approximation at the edges of a BEC, but it works pretty well in the middle. This delta of 50 was exactly where the inner radius of the BEC, which again is well defined because there's no tail, where it becomes zero. So this was the place where the inner radius of the shell, if you're moving this way, was running into itself. So then we thought, okay, maybe this cusp is an artifact of the fact that we have the Thomas Fermi approximation where we're making the inner wall of the BEC an actual place as opposed to being kind of a <coughs> smeared out density. So we went back and we said, okay, what if you do the hydrodynamic equations, but instead of using the Thomas Fermi density, you use the numerical density. So that's nice and smooth. If you do that, you get this. And this, I think, looks a lot like this. So that gave us enough clues that we started to realize that what's happening in this dip is that that must be the place where the center is filling in. If you fill in the center with the Thomas Fermi approximation, you're doing something kind of dumb because you're imagining that the BEC goes from being a shell to a filled sphere at exactly one instant instead of kind of gradually filling in the center. But we think this dip then is real as we go from a thin shell out towards a filled sphere. Or another way of thinking about it is if you start with the filled sphere and you start to move that maximum density radius out, at some point you start to hollow out the center. And when you hollow out the center, that's where you're going to see the frequencies of these modes stop going down and start going back up again. Okay, so that makes sense, but why? Why would the frequency go down and then back up again? So this is a picture of what's happening to, this is a 1D cut, this is X, and this is the density, and it's what's happening in time as those oscillations are happening. And this is for the sphere. You notice most of the oscillations are happening right in the center. This over here, sorry, I'm losing my green. Over here, this is out at a pretty thin shell of delta of 100. And again, most of the oscillations are happening kind of, and it turns out, on the shoulder and on the top of the shell. When I go to a delta of 60, which is right where this dip is, the density in equilibrium is very close to zero at the center. But that's also where all the oscillations are happening. Uh-oh, now I've got everybody on it. Sorry. Earlier technology. There should be. I was probably making you ill with my joggling it around, though I'm much more comfortable with a stick. Um, look at how these density, so the place where the oscillations are happening is also the place where the equilibrium density is very close to zero. So as we're getting this sort of thinning out in the middle, the oscillations are actually congregating there. And what happens if you have almost no BEC at all, but that's also where you're having a lot of the oscillations happening, is that you're essentially seeing, if you like, the stiffness of the system going to zero, because there's essentially no stuff there in the place where the BEC wants to oscillate. And so that's why the frequency is going to zero. It's not really going all the way to zero, but the point is, as you're getting a lot of oscillations in a place with small density, you're getting a much lower frequency. All right, so we feel like we understand why you get this dip in the frequencies. And more importantly, we think that might be kind of cool. It's telling you at the point in delta where you're starting to get a hollow center. So the place where there's a minimum in the frequency is actually telling you something about the center of the system. So now we like this plot a lot more. It matches the thin shell. It matches the filled sphere. And this dip should be, we hope, a sort of universal feature of having suddenly or less than suddenly no density in the center for your oscillations. Okay. Hmm. I think I have enough time. Yeah. As a check, though, can you change that big omega and see the shift in the dip uh, location? We should. <laughs> 
So if I make the thickness of the shell bigger, then it's going to fill in earlier. Haven't done it yet, but we should do that. And I think it'll give us the right answer. But yeah, I should check that. Good. I want to sort of change gears a little bit and make sure I talk about how you would actually make one of these. And the problem is it's hard for two reasons. So I'll explain why it's hard on Earth. So if you have a bubble trap of the type I described and you are really happy you're going to get this, the problem is you also have gravity. And in a normal harmonic trap, gravity doesn't really matter because you can complete the square. The whole thing just moves down, but it still acts like it's harmonically trapped. That doesn't work with the spherical shell B, C. If you just imagined a shell and then I pull on all of it, what's going to happen? Top's going to get a little bald. The bottom's going to get a little heavier. And indeed, if I add this term MGZ and then I just play around with MG, like I could just turn gravity on and off, it does what you would expect. In Z, a little bit of MG is lifting up one of those minima. And that means that if I find the ground state, you'll notice I've sagged. So this is called the sag problem. <laughs> so we've got a sagged BEC. This is still kind of a complete BC. There's still non-zero density at the top, but it's just not that pretty. And the problem is for most, most realistic parameters that I've run, you're really looking more like something like this for the actual 9.8 meters per second squared, and that's going to look like that. Yeah. Oh, that is just absolutely my inability to get MATLAB to um, dump to EPS correctly. Sorry, no lattice at all. My grid size is, so here's from 0 to 20. My grid size is 0.25, because it is numerically done. So I do have a grid size, but it's 0.25. So yeah, the actual lattice is much bigger than that. But there's no optical lattice. Is that your question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, that's totally my fault. You notice it's not here. I don't remember why. <laughs> but that's... Um, that's making figures in MATLAB, so that's my fault. Um, by the time you get to realistic Earth-like parameters, you're really making a contact lens at the bottom of your trap, um, which is still interesting. So the group in Paris has studied a BEC in this sort of trap, and they, they use it as a selling point. You're making a very thin, but still, still kind of um, cylindrically symmetric pancake of sort of an interesting shape. So that's a bummer. Are we ever going to see these things? Clearly, the problem is gravity. What do you do when the problem is gravity? Drop it down a mine shaft or put it into orbit. Good. It turns out um, we got to NASA first before that mine shaft, people. Um, there's already, <laughs> there's already um, a movement afoot to do cold atoms research on the International Space Station. It's called CAL, the Cold Atom Laboratory. Um, Nathan Lundblatt was, had decided to write a grant to NASA to try to put a bubble trap on the International Space Station, and he found me because I had written some theory papers that mentioned the words bubble trap. And so now I got to be on his grant, which is awesome. Um, it's supposed to launch in June of 2017, and then it'll take data for some number of years after that. The runs are all about 20 seconds long, which is cool, and they're in microgravity, so at least 10 to the minus 6 less gravity than we have on Earth. Um, it uses one of these cool uh, sort of BC on a chip things. Everybody who's doing experiments has to use the same chip. So that's the problem we'll talk about in a second. Um, for this next flight, I think there's a total of seven projects that are going up. Um, and, and Nathan is the PI on that grant. So um, probably somebody lied to you when they told you that microgravity really was going to be 10 to minus 6G. Yeah. So <laughs> if, uh, how even small if it's, does it really have to be in order to work a whole lot better than well, I would say even milli is going to be way better because you can yeah. see um, even from here, this is just a factor of 10 difference from here to here. And then I didn't do like 0. 0.0001, but I think you're going to get a lot better. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, that would have been exciting. Um, okay. Good I, question. I yeah, that looks fine. Yeah, of, of all the things that we're a little worried about on the space station, the microgravity is not going to be the main problem. <laughs> As you might guess, no, the main, yeah. <laughs> 
Yes, no, you're right. It's absolutely good, good. I always try to hammer this home with my undergraduates because we think space is the place where there's no gravity. No, space is the place where you're in free fall if you're in orbit, absolutely. So this is the reason why it's microgravity is because you're, um, you're in free fall, but you're not in exactly free fall. Um, good, thank you. It is both being dropped and being in space. So this, this chip is not what you would use if you wanted to make a perfectly spherically symmetric BEC because all of the wires are on one plane and you have to make your whole trap using just the wires that are there on the chip. So unfortunately, so far, the best we've been able to do right now is to make an ellipsoid, which is okay. So here I'm showing you the ellipse, which is the surface of minimum potential for that Cal chip. Um, but there's lots of things we can tune to try to change that. So that's one of the things that Nathan is working very intensively on. Um, on the right, I'm showing you what would happen if I loaded 30,000 atoms into that chip potential, and here's 200,000 atoms in that chip potential. And so what you'll notice is that not only is it not a sphere, which would be not that big of a deal, but the atoms are not going uniformly over the surface. And the reason for that is that actually the confinement frequency is varying over the surface of the shell. And again, that has to do with just the fact that we're really in more like a cylindrically symmetric situation, not a spherically symmetric situation because we're doing everything in a plane. Um, but at an N of 200,000 atoms, you're starting to see at least a fully covered shell. I'm not showing you how thick it is. I'll show you that in the next plot. So this is just sort of the outer surface. But you're getting a lot of particles at these two poles, and you're getting a pretty good coverage of particles in the middle if you can get a lot of atoms in there. Now, the thing that's really funny around the equator, if you can call it the equator, I is think, that an artifact or is that real? I think that's an artifact of, of the fact that finding the surface of minimum potential is actually not a super well-defined concept. Um, if you're not spherically symmetric, because you have to pick a line to then find the minimum along, and I'm not doing a very good job of that here. Okay, let me show you cuts, because those are actually more believable. So this is a cut in one plane of that ellipsoid. Here's a cut in another plane, and that's a cut on the other plane. So here you can see a little bit more easily that at just 30,000 atoms, you're really getting bare spots at, if you like, the top and the bottom and sort of around the equator. But if you can fill in more like 200,000 atoms, then you're starting to see a more complete coverage around the whole ellipsoid. Although it's never gonna be the same density everywhere, which is a bummer. But um, I want to try to convince you that this is still interesting. Um, that's what happens if you release it. And that's easy to do, you just turn everything off. <laughs> and then um, you should see some interference patterns. The reason why they're so weird is because this isn't a sphere. The interference pattern of a sphere, everything gets to maximum density at the center, but if you have an ellipsoid, you're getting maximum density in like a couple of different weird places because there's foci and other things going on. So we're still, um, we're still working a little bit on how would you analyze the interference patterns that are coming out of this, yeah. I think because it was, as long as I have fairly complete coverage, I want to assume that the initial phase over the whole BEC is constant. You're saying if I actually have like two caps? If it's sufficiently depleted in the middle, I don't know if that's a safe process. I agree with you. I would have to run it again with having one phase on one cap, another phase on the other cap. But again, we're hoping that we can take this um, to a large enough number of atoms that there's still some atoms here to, if you like, bridge those two caps. So then I would expect one phase. Good question. I think all that happens if I make two different phases is that the phase pattern shifts, but the frequency stays the same. I think that's an interesting interaction between the as well. Maybe, okay. Good, that'd be cool to talk about. Sorry, let me go back to the movie. Um, actually, I guess I should finish because I didn't leave very many time, much time for questions. I just think it's kind of cool. Okay, um, good, I hope I've convinced you that a shell-shaped condensate would be kind of interesting. Um, you can tune continuously between a basically 2D thin surface and all the way out to a very common filled sphere. Um, 
the collective modes, those numerics that I was talking about, I would call kind of quench numerics because we're making a sudden change and then just watching what's happening in time. Um, I think there's something interesting in the evolution of the frequencies of the collective modes. You're getting a signature of where the BEC is becoming hollow. And I'm hoping that we can test some of this on the Cal chip. Um, but we have to figure out exactly what questions to ask because we're not going to have a full sphere and we're not necessarily going to have a full uniformity. But I think we can work on that. Thank you for your time. Sorry, I thought I made that so short, but then it took forever. We had a lot of good questions during this talk. Um, right, forgive me if this is a naive BEC question. I'm not a BEC guy. But so I can blow soap bubbles here on Earth, and they do get thicker on the bottom yes. if, they, if they stick around long enough. But you can still do it because of surface tension. Right? Yeah. So is that something that doesn't exist in any way in BEC? Um, is there no like analogy for it that you can maybe leverage to do it? That's such a good question. I, so the grad student who's been working on this, she has been working on the gravity sag piece of it um, in terms of whether we could still extract something about the collective modes. And she was talking about it in terms of the, the shell bursting. And I kind of questioned her on that because I was like, I just don't think there is something like surface tension in a BEC. But, but I would need to sit down basically with those hydrodynamic equations and ask myself, OK, Compare this to a non-BEC fluid. What are the terms that are coming together? And make sure I'm not saying something stupid because I just don't see the analogy. But there's nothing in that sagging picture that I was showing you that's like a burst event. It's like it's full, and then it's a little depleted, and then it's more depleted. And I, I don't know if I have a handle for something like that. But that's a really good question. Yeah? Is it possible to use a magnetic gradient to compensate the gravity? Good question. Zobe and Garraway said, you should be able to do this with an extra gradient. And then if you actually run the numbers, the, um, the control you have to have on that gradient is so high that it's laughable. Like any experimentalist who's actually tried to do this, if you say, oh, well, why don't you just essentially levitate it with an extra field, they go, come on, you can't do that. Because then you have to have um, the amount of variation you can have in that slope her distance is just way out of the realm of experimental possibility, is what I've been told. Good question. Uh, so you used the evaporative cooling potential, but now you're in some different internal atomic state. Can you cool this gas now? That's a good question. I need to I need to double check with Nathan. He's he's trapped, I think, in this. And the 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 group in Paris has trapped there also. I don't understand whether what they do is they cool for a while and then they somehow move themselves into the other potential or whether they cool while in that potential. That's a really good question. Because you're right, it's, um, it's of a shape that there's no way to evaporatively cool. So I think you must have to pre-cool it and then 